Welcome to a series that we call The Problem with Churches, where we're going through the book of Malachi verse by verse to take a look at what it is God expects of its pastors, preachers, and priests of the church back then as well as today. God put me in a spiritual front lines several years ago when I got into Christian education and got deeply involved with the church. These spiritual front lines lasted for years. And it started to show me things that I could see in churches that I normally couldn't see. More so, two years ago, God even told me he was going to show me things. And man, has he. The number of problems that I have received as a spiritual leader and a Christian leader of a school from Muslims, Jews, atheists, anti-theists, Buddhists, everybody, zero. The number of problems caused by Christians is all of them. Kind of what I'm referring to is slander and gossip, receiving goods and services and refusing to pay for it, writing bad checks. Um, this can go on and on and on, and it's a constant battle to fight against these evils. A hundred percent of the problems caused for those little Christian schools have been caused by Christians. And what I've discovered is there, whether it be in the church or church members, church leadership, whatever the case may be, I've discovered that there are two types of Christians in this world, wilderness wandering Christians and promise taking Christians. And that's a very definitive behavior based on which two of those two groups you belong to. And the promise taking Christians is definitely the minority. So I wanted to take this first episode and just talk about what that actually looks like before we get into the book of Malachi. I want to start off by saying there are some outstanding churches out there. To suggest that all the churches are bad was definitely something I didn't mean to do with my I Quit video because there's definitely some outstanding churches. But of all the churches in Johnson County and Jackson County, Missouri that I've been to, I can think of five that are actually doing the right thing, but I've interacted with hundreds. That's a huge deficit. So I want to take a look at this idea of promise-taking Christians versus wilderness-wandering Christians. We're going to start in the book of Exodus 3, 7, and 8. Now Moses has seen the burning bush, and it says in 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to land flowing with milk and honey. So Moses goes and frees the Jews. They go, they, 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 get, in, they get chased by the Egyptians. Uh, God parts the Red Sea. They walk across on dry land. Meanwhile, fire from the sky consumes the Egyptians and put up, puts up a wall until they can get across, and then the, the sea just devours the Egyptians. And once they're on the other side, they start complaining to God, like, oh, what are we going to do? Now we're over here starving to death. And then they go through the whole wilderness, doubting God, denying God, even though they're watching miracle after miracle after miracle. It's an amazing thing to read because the very first time I became a Christian, at the very beginning, I went and bought a Bible and I read, starting in Genesis, and when I got to this part, I just could not believe their doubt, but the realization is we all doubt. It's easy to say it when you're reading it. It's harder to do it when you're living it. And let's just go ahead and jump to Numbers, and now they get to uh, where God had sent them to this promised land, this land that was promised long before them to Abraham. This has been a land that was inherited by the Jews way back in the beginning of civilization. And now Moses and the Jews are about to walk into that promise. But what happens here is Moses sends in 12 spies. We're going to pick it up in Numbers 17. So Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are forests there or not, be of good courage. 
and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron. Ammon, Shishai, and Talmai, and the descendants of Anak were there. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, and they cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole, and they also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the valley of Eshol, because of the clusters which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. So they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron, and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. This is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites and the Jebusites. And the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with them said, We are not able to go up against these people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people who we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? And then because of that fear and the lack of trust in God and the promises that he made them from long before them, and all the deliverance he gave, he made them wander around the, the wilderness for 40 more years till all of them were dead, and it was only their descendants along with Aaron and Joshua, who were able to cross over and take the promise that God had for them. Now, this is a significant story because it absolutely applies to the church and to the Christians of the world, especially in America. Because once this took place, after they conquered the promised land, we saw the rise and fall of Saul, David, the golden years of Solomon, the kings of Judah and Israel, the rise of Babylon, the fall of Babylon, and the rise of Persia. And finally, we get to Malachi. And Malachi was written almost a thousand years later in 400 BC, after the Jews were released from captivity from Babylon by the Persians, and they rebuilt the temple. This whole generation that Malachi was in didn't know or trust in the power of God and relied on themselves, much like the Jews did in Moses' day. This lack of belief in God's providential care led them into selfish worship and fearing that God will provide for them. They're focusing on numbers and profiting off the sacrifices of the temple because they believed this is the, it was more of a business to them and not a state of worship of the true living God. Pastors, preachers, priests, all over America are settling for captivity and comfort instead of relying on the miracles of God, of healings, of resurrections, and of bringing in great resources to allow for provision to take care of their community. And that's where we're at. Many practices taught during the captivity of the Jews were then brought into the temple um, and falsely led much of their worship during Malachi's day. Malachi's words were the very last words that God spoke to anybody until there was 400 years of silence and Jesus returned. And what they saw, Malachi, after Malachi's day, they watched the Greeks, the Seleucius, the Ptolemaic, and the Roman empires completely dominate over them 
because of the selfish ways of God's people. All they cared about was taking care of themselves. They did not trust in the divine, awesome power and love of God. And they leaned on their own understanding and they stole from the temple of God to try to survive. I believe that the state of the churches in the world is right there. That is where we are. Churches all over the world, they don't trust in the divine power of God to provide their needs, to provide for the community around them. We're looking at a state of churches where just simply preaching and teaching and putting on the Sunday show is all they are capable of. Where are all the miracles? Where are all the healings? They're definitely not taking place in most churches in America, just like they weren't taking place in Malachi's day. So when we get into Malachi, the very first verse is the burden of the word of the Lord to Malachi. It's a burden to God. It, it's a shame that he has to even talk about this stuff and bring it up. It really is a shame. And God has shown me some things. And to be honest, if you're a wilderness wandering Christian or you're part of a wilderness wandering church, you will never see these things. You will stay on the wrong side of the Jordan River and all you really want is you just want to be led back into comfort and captivity just like the Jews did. But there was those few, the two out of 12, that said, no, it is ours for the taking. God promised it to us, and it is ours. And they went and they took it 40 years later. So this is the state of the church in America right now. I think the most important part for me is God told me to do this. His words to me were to blow a trumpet. We have to talk and address the state of the church in America directly, face to face. It can't be this hidden thing where we just say really delicate things because ultimately what we have is we have some church going wilderness wanderers who will, they just want the church the way they want it. Uh, they want to change, but they don't want to change anything. They want to grow, but they don't want any new people. They're afraid to take the promises of God. So they're leaning on this comfort of captivity. And that is the state of the church in America. You guys, this is going to be an awesome ride. I don't want to just put my words in it. We're going to go through the book of Malachi verse by verse so we can be these promise-taking Christians and not be led astray by the vast, sheer volume of wilderness-wandering Christians out there. Because I do believe if you come across 10 Christians, chances are all of them are wilderness wandering Christians, if not at least nine of them. And that's what we see. Churches all over America are wilderness wandering churches where they're just trying to get through Sunday so they can get their ties, keeps the lights on, and then they just prepare for the next Sunday. It is about the coming of a kingdom of Jesus Christ. It is not about being comfortable anymore. God is telling us to blow a trumpet on the problem with churches. I'd love to hear your comments on us. Join us every Sunday. This is episode one. We're going to hit Malachi verse by verse starting today and then beginning next Sunday and continuing on until we're done. It may take us a year or two to get through this little book, but there are some deep truths about the state of the church in America deeply written in the prophet of Malachi. If you like this video, click like and subscribe. If you feel called to support our channel through Patreon, that link is below. The most important part of this channel is we take prayer requests. Never hesitate to send that in. We believe in the power of prayer and the miracles that God brings. And we've seen them time and time again. So definitely don't hesitate to send those in. Thank you for watching this episode of God, Family, and Guns. And as always, love God, love your family, and love guns.